Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Turn your Bibles, please, to Romans 5.2 this morning. Romans 5.2. So remember last week, I was going to go through Romans 5, 1 and 2, and decided that really the message that the Lord gave me last week was really about 5.1, and there's no pressure other than my Google Calendar telling me that I needed to make it to verse 2, so I just stopped. And now we come back to verse 2 this morning, and the Lord's, perfect is, uh, the Lord's timing is always perfect, even if my language is not. Have you ever been invited to special access for a VIP? Some of you have. Now, I'm not talking about your wife (laughs) or your kids or Nana. I'm talking about a real VIP, like a president of the United States or a general officer or, you know, the president of of a prestigious university or an athlete, a nationally known athlete or celebrity, have you ever been given the access to be with someone that, for most people, consider a very important person? When I was a first lieutenant in Kosovo, I was given the uh, privilege to be aide-de-camp to a general officer. He was a one-star general, brigadier general. He was the commander of multinational forces, Brigade East. So the, the uh, American commander of all forces in Kosovo back in 2003. And I was called to be his aide-de-camp, his personal assistant. And, and this was a, uh, a daunting task, but it was also a great privilege. Uh, I ran his calendar. I uh, coordinated transportation. I arranged everything. I carried his backpack full of coins. I've got one with me this morning. Uh, so these are called challenge coins. You may not be able to see it, but, uh, but this is a coin that came from him. This is his coin there in Kosovo. And I would carry a backpack full of these. And uh, whenever we would go visit troops, you know, he would... He would I would hand him a dozen or so coins and, and he would give those out to soldiers and um, that was a, a meaningful thing for them and meaningful thing for me. I, I was able to uh, ride with him in his up-armored Suburban. However, um, the, the general gets maximum leg room and so my, uh, you know, my, my knees are in the dashboard, but it was, it was a trip just to be in the, uh, in the suburban. I got to fly in his Black Hawk helicopter. Everywhere he went, I went with him, and uh, including when we made trips to international posts. So we went to Bulgarians, we went to the Russians, and we would land in there or we would drive in there and we'd be given special access, and I'm right there with him on his coattails into the command post and meeting the commanders and, and meeting all these people. It was a, it was a great privilege for me to have that kind of special access to what I would call a VIP, a general officer. And what was funny is that as a first lieutenant, you know, I shared office space. I mean, my office is just outside of his door and we drank out of the same coffee pot. Uh, and these senior leaders would come into the office and they would come to me and they, they ask me, they'd say, Brian, uh, how's the old man feeling today? What's his mood today? Before they, before they go into the door and, and stand in front of him, uh, they'd ask me. And that was, that was just a really funny feeling to have uh, senior leaders coming to me. What I realized is that I had access that even they did not have. And, and that was really neat. Well, this morning, we're going to look at uh, two of the three consequences of our having been justified by faith. Last week, I talked about how Uh, When Paul says that we have been justified by faith, there are consequences to having been justified by faith. The first is that we have peace with God. The second is that we have access to his grace. And the third is that we hope in his glory. So let's look here at Romans 5, 2, at this access that we have been given to the VIP. Amen? Amen? All right, Romans 5, 2. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we get to stand in your grace, that we get to hope in your glory, that you have redeemed us, you have made us whole, you have made us new by faith in your son. And I pray, Lord, that you would get all the glory and all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so our faith not only gets counted to us as righteousness, as Paul has said, but it comes with access 
into this grace. We get to enter, or as Paul says, stand in. You see it in verse two? We stand in this grace in which we stand. We stand in God's grace. We dwell in it. Since we have peace with God through Christ, through him we also have access to grace. Now this access is not just any kind of access. The word used here for access denotes the kind of access that a royalty would extend to someone to come into their presence. It was an, it was an invitation to come into the presence of royalty. Folks, sometimes I think that we lose sight of what we have really been given. The King of Kings, the Creator God, the Great I Am, has invited you to enter into, to access His grace. You know, I was a little bit starstruck, a little bit mesmerized when I became that aide de camp. But that general officer, as great of a leader as he was, as good of a man as he was, was a mere man. You and I have been granted access to El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, El Elyon, God Most High, Elohim, Creator God, and Jehovah Sabaoth, the God of hosts. Let's go back to the beginning. Adam and Eve, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. Unhindered, unobstructed, unlimited access to God. They had peace with God. In Genesis 3, 8, it tells us that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, does it tell us that every day since creation that God walked in the garden, but in this case, it seems as if this is just normal, that God made a habit, as what is my take, that God made a habit of walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. His presence was there. They were with God in the Garden of Eden. But something changed. Something changed. When in 3.8, God walked in the garden and in the cool of the day, he called out, Adam, where are you? Something has changed. There's no longer access. There's no longer connection. Now there is separation and there is division. Adam and Eve had sinned. They had broken connection with God. And of course, God knew where Adam and Eve was, right? God calls out, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was, but now Adam knows that something has changed. Now Adam is aware that there is separation and division between man and God. And we know something has changed substantially. Adam and Eve have rebelled against God, have violated his only command of not eating the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They've rejected his authority, rebelled against him, and now there is separation. But it it wasn't always this way nor was it supposed to be this way. God curses man, God curses woman, God curses Satan for their sin, and he removes them from the Garden of Eden, which, if you consider this, is the first act of grace. Maybe covering their, sin, their shame with animal skin was the first act of grace, but removing them from the Garden of Eden was maybe the second act of grace because he prohibits them, he prevents them from access to the tree of life where they would live forever cut off from God. Where they would live forever cut off from God. So he removes them from the Garden of Eden with their access to the tree of life And he puts an angel with a flaming sword to prohibit them, to prevent them from entering again. And they are banished into the wilderness alone. 
All throughout the Old Testament, we see the theme of restricted access to God. Only Moses could meet with God on the mountain and in the wilderness. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies in the temple. And he could only do it once a year and only after atoning for his own sin. No access. For 4,000 years, man had no access to God, was prevented from drawing near to our God. But on Calvary, as the Son of God hung upon the cross, something remarkable happened. The earth quaked. The ground shook. The temple shook. And the veil which separated the Holy of Holies, we think it was about four inches thick of woven material, about 30 feet tall, was ripped from the top to the bottom. The veil that was meant to stand in the way between God on, in the Holy of Holies and man on the other side was ripped from the top to the bottom while the Son of God hung upon the cross. Within the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant where God caused his presence to dwell. It radiated with the glory of God. And like the flaming sword at the Garden of Eden, this veil was meant to prevent access of man into the presence of God. But in the death of Christ, access was restored by God himself. This is perhaps the most vivid evidence of God's grace that there is, that sinners like you and like me are ushered into his presence, that we've been given access to him and not sheepish access. But look, Ephesians 3, 12 says we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. As the aide de camp, I was given special access. No one questioned me for being in the office outside of his door. That was my place. I had special access, but my access was not without limits. I didn't just waltz into his office. I certainly didn't just waltz into his quarters. There were limits to my access to this VIP. My kids, on the other hand, they have unlimited access to me. They dwell in my home. And if my door is open, they can walk right in. And if my door is closed, they can knock. And if I'm not predisposed, they are free to enter into my space. Why? Because they're my kids. They have unlimited access to me. When we first moved here, my kids were nine, seven, five, and three. And now my youngest is nine. <laughs> nine, seven, five, and three. And I remember Kelly would come up on Tuesdays and she would bring all the kids and, and, and that was such a joyful moment for me because I'd be sitting at my desk and I've got a big important job here, you know. That's, I mean, I'm sitting at my desk and, you know, but my kids don't care. Here they come running down the hallway. I hear the pitter patter of their feet running. They come into my office. What do they expect? A smile on my face. They expect me to delight that they have come into my presence and I never fail to delight in their presence, of welcoming them into my office, into my space. They had boldness, they had confidence, and it was a blessing to me, it was a blessing to them. And they still do, and they always will. And parents, I'm sure you feel the same way about your kids, right? Okay. This is what the Bible tells us that we have. We are not slaves, we have been adopted as sons, we are invited into the house. Let us then with confidence, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy 
and find grace and help or to help in time of need. We can enter into God's presence the same way that Adam and Eve entered into God's presence in the garden because they had peace with God. And having been justified, we also have peace with God. And because we have peace with God through faith in him, we also have grace and we have access to this grace in which we stand. What's even more astonishing to me is that we don't actually have to go into a place (laughs) to find access to God. But God has caused his spirit to dwell within us. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? The spirit of God who caused, uh, God who caused the spirit to dwell in the temple and to be cut off from all people has placed his spirit within the lives of every born again believer. Brother and sister, by faith in Jesus Christ, you are never apart from God. For he dwells within you through his spirit who he has caused to dwell. So if this phase if, this, if the phrase that we covered last week, we have been justified, reveals to us that there is something that has happened in the past that has continual effect. We have been justified. That's a past action, has continual effect. Then what does we have access reveal? It reveals this is a present experience of every born again believer. This is present, it's continual. It will go on until we die and we see Jesus face to face. We have access. We continually stand in God's grace. Now what is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God, the goodness of God, the unhindered, uninhibited, undefeatable, irresistible, Grace, goodness, kindness, mercy of God. It is God's determination to give to you what you can never earn yourself. It is his free gift. Grace is God's disposition of kindness that causes him to give sinners what we do not deserve. For by grace, you have been saved. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8. But we are not only saved by grace in one moment. That would be enough, amen? Amen. If our experience of God's grace was simply the moment that we were saved, that would be enough. But that's not all that we experience of God's grace. No, we stand in God's grace. We didn't just pass through, right? We stand in God's grace we are also sustained by grace. We are saved by grace and we are sustained by grace. When Paul was dealing with with what he called the thorn in his flesh, he asked the Lord three times to remove it. He tells us this in 2 Corinthians. He says, "I, I wanted God, would you remove the thorn in my flesh? The thorn was given to him so that he would not be conceited because he was shown a vision of heaven, he tells us. And God sent a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, to keep Paul from being conceited. And when Paul asks him to take it away, he says, rather than taking it away, I'm going to sustain you while you have it. My grace is sufficient for you, Jesus said. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So Jesus is like, nah, no, I'm not going to take this hard thing from your life. Because if I take this hard thing out of your life, it might ruin you, Paul. You might get conceited and and boast that you have also seen a vision of heaven. I'm going to keep this thorn in your flesh to protect you from yourself. But I will sustain you through the pain 
by my grace. I will strengthen you, I will uplift you, support you, and encourage you, was Jesus' message to Paul. And the amazing thing about Jesus' sustaining sufficient grace is that it's not limited to first century apostles. Praise the Lord for that. This is what, if we go back a couple of chapters before that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we see here Paul's words. He says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. Who? You. Me. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Paul knew that, that Jesus works through our weakness. Don't you wish at times that Jesus would just make you the type of person that wouldn't have any problems anymore? That you would have the perfect wisdom, the, the perfect character, the perfect responses, the perfect words, the perfect thoughts, and you would never struggle in life? Why doesn't he do that? Because we would not need him. And Paul knows that God works in us and through us through our weaknesses so that God gets the glory. So that when something amazing happens, so that when we're part of something that, that works, so that when, when we can look at fruit in our lives, we can say, glory be to God, there's nothing good in me except Christ. Yes. Paul says we stand in his grace. To stand is to remain, it is to dwell. So the saving and sustaining grace, we stand in it, we dwell in it. It's ongoing, it's continual. We don't walk through it, let it sprinkle us. We stand in it and let it soak us. My question for you this morning is, are you standing in the grace of God? Are you letting it cover you from head to toe to fill you up and to make you new? Are you relying upon his grace like that? How do we stand in the grace of God? A couple of biblical principles that I, I think would be helpful here. The first of all is that we choose not to lean on our own understanding. to work in our own power, to hope in our own righteousness, or to boast in our own virtue. Instead, we choose to trust in the Lord with all our hearts, to hope in him and to boast, not in our strengths, but in our weaknesses. There's another truth that we need to unpack here with standing in God's grace. Are you doing that? Are you standing in his grace? Lean not on your own understanding, but trusting in him with all your heart. Boasting not in your strength, but in your weaknesses. Hoping in him rather than in yourself. But there is another aspect to this standing in grace that we need to unpack. Because we stand in God's grace today, here, now, we know that we will also stand on that great judgment day. Because we stand in God's grace now, we know that we will also stand in grace on judgment day which I think that in the moment when we finally see the judgment before our eyes, uh, we will rejoice exceedingly that we are standing in God's grace on that day. It is only because we have the assurance that we will stand on judgment day in grace that Paul can continue in verse two where he says, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. If we did not stand in God's grace today, there is no way that you and I would have any reason to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Why is that? Because the glory of God is an all-consuming fire. When Moses went up onto the mountain, 
He asked the Lord, please show me your glory. Moses wanted to see the glory of God. He wanted to behold the glory of God. And, and God says, uh, sorry, Moses, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand to block your view. And when I pass by, I'll allow you to see me, see, see my backside. I'll allow you to see me as I pass. He says, for you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. How is it possible that you and I would rejoice in the hope of the glory of God when he tells Moses, no man shall see me and live? Yes, Jesus, that's right, Jesus. When Moses came down from the mountain, he was glowing. And the people, it says, it says the people were afraid to approach him because he was radiating the glory of God. Now we know something about radiating. The moon radiates the light of the sun, right? The moon has no light, no glory, no energy itself. All it does is reflect the light of the sun. But on some days you can step outside and it's as if it's daylight at night because the reflection of the light of the sun off the moon. Now, if Moses reflected the glory of God, like the sun reflects the light, uh, the, the moon reflects the light of the sun, and it made the people afraid to even approach Moses because of the reflection of the glory, brother and sister, how much more terrifying would it have been for the people to enter into the glory of God himself? We've landed on the moon. We can't even get close to the sun. For those that stand in his grace, by faith in his son, when we behold the glory of God, it's going to be too wonderful for words. It will be everything that you could possibly imagine and infinitely more. But for those who do not stand in the grace of God by faith in his son, it will be equally as awful. The glory of God is an all-consuming fire. Our hope is that one day we will dwell in the glory of God forever, just like we were originally created to do. That, that's, that's who we are. We, were, we are image bearers of God. We were created as the crown of, uh, of his glory, crown of creation. We were created to reflect his glory. We were created to dwell in his glory. And one day we hope not wishful thinking as Pastor Matt covered a few weeks ago, but we longingly anticipate it is our hope of the Christian that we are going to stand in his grace, in the presence of his glory, and we will behold his glory. And because we have already seen Jesus, we know that there is nothing to fear. Listen to what John says in John 1.14. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So what will it feel like to stand in the glory of God? It will feel like fullness of truth and fullness of grace. No deception, no condemnation, no manipulation, no frustration, only glory. The hope of the glory of God is letting biblical principles or biblical promises of the life to come gird us up and strengthen us during the trials in this life. We hope, we look forward, that's a future hope of ours, and the future hope should strengthen us 
to endure the trials of life today. Paul said the glory awaiting us is far greater than any sufferings of this life. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Look at the comparison. All of my suffering, this is the, the same letter that Paul lays out shipwrecked and, and snake bitten and left for dead and, and imprisoned. And he says this light and momentary suffering is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. <laughs> glory like this. Revelation 21.4, Jesus promises he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. All of the bad things that are just part of life are gone. All the suffering, all the agony, all the frustration, all the fear, all the anxiety, all of the uh, broken relationships, all of that in eternity is gone and Jesus wipes away every tear from every eye and he makes everything new. And it will never end. Matthew nineteen twenty nine. Jesus promises everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Jesus sees the sacrifices that people make for his name's sake. This is the hope that every servant of Christ should be longing to hear Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. In this life, you've been faithful. What I've entrusted you in this life is little. I will set you over much. Now watch. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh. What do you think God's disposition is going to be to those who are ushered into heaven? <laughs> Joy. I think Paul says that, that God gives us salvation so that he can, he can bestow upon us his unending mercy. The riches of his mercy and grace. God, God is, is getting ready to pour out his grace and mercy upon us forever. For those who stand in his grace by faith in his son. So church, I want to invite you to join Peter in praising our father in heaven when he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't we read that together? Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The promises of what awaits those who stand in the grace of God are meant to strengthen us in the trials and the sufferings of this life. It is meant to strengthen the weak knees and the feeble hearts so that we can stand in the face of adversity and we can hope, we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God so that we can in fact rejoice, you ready, in our sufferings. But that's next week. The only way that we can rejoice in our sufferings is that we're standing in his grace and hoping in his glory. Amen? Amen? Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, glorious one, holy one. We worship you. We praise you. Lead us, help us, sustain us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.